Assalamu alaikum to all of you. Thank you for coming over here and thank you all of you who are logging in from all over the world. Uh, it's, uh, this is the first time I'm trying to do something which is both live as well as uh, being streamed on the web. And uh, so uh, some of you who are people who probably have no through social media but have never met personally or spoken to, welcome to all of you for this class. Uh, consider this class as a uh, uh, 101 class, but for those who are primarily believers. Uh, in these four sessions, uh, which will be on four Fridays uh, starting today, Java, uh, I will be focusing on four important aspects of our faith. Uh, you could call them as a team, but they're not technically that. Number one, I will be talking a little bit about the Quran, uh, how it was revealed, how it was preserved and uh, what are the important issues uh, that we need to know about the Quran as we read it. The second one is going to be about the Sahaba. Without whom we do not have the Quran or any of the sources of our deen. The third class will be about the various knowledges or epistemes that we have developed uh, as part of Islamic studies, for example, or what is the study of Hadith, for example, Ilm al Hadith, what is the study of the Quran, Ilm al Quran. Today's lecture is part of what would, in a traditional Islamic school, we call Ilm al Quran. So if you were taking a course called Ilm al Quran or specializing in the Quran, besides memorizing the Quran, this is what you would be learning in a traditional school. Uh, and then the final lecture will be about uh, a very interesting uh, tradition in Islamic heritage, which is the collection of Fatiha Hadith. Uh, I will talk about that tradition. I will primarily talk about Imam Nawawi's 40 slash 42 traditions, uh, their content, why he selected them, why many of them are important, and we all ought to have read at least uh, a large section of those uh, traditions. Uh, and then we will talk about uh, the 40 hadiths that have been collected by various other scholars, and I have a bunch of them that I will be bringing to class. So let's begin with today's discussion on the Quran. As you all know that uh, Ramadan and Quran are like twins. Uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that you reveal the Quran in the mind. Uh, in the, I, fully, I don't fully understand what that means because the understanding of the Quran was revealed over a period of 23 years. So many, a large segment of the Quran was revealed in many different uh, Ramadans, or you could argue that maybe that there are stages in Revelation and the first stage of Quran's descent uh, began in the month of Ramadan. Uh, according to one tradition, Quran was revealed on the 23rd night of the month of Ramadan. And also that tradition says that uh, all the other religious sources, such as the Torah and the Bible, and the messages that were revealed to Ibrahim and Dawud al Islam were all revealed uh, in the month of Ramadan itself. So, what do we need to know about the Quran, inshallah? If you are able to see the first slide, uh, the first thing that we should know is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, inna nahnu nazalna al-sikr wa inna lahul. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, indeed, it is I who sent on the Quran, and indeed, we will be guarding it. So, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala identifies himself as the guardian of the Quran. It is in the 15th chapter of the Quran, it's the ninth verse. So, the first thing that we need to know about the Quran is that unlike other revelations in the past, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself has guaranteed its protection and the fact that it could be preserved in the the Quran itself has a lot of discussion about the past revelations. Uh, one of the things that is uh, an issue for those of us who sometimes participate in interfaith dialogue is that it is possible that the past revelations have been distorted. There are suggestions that maybe the, the, in the collection of the Bible or the Torah or additions or subtractions have been made or human interventions have been made. Uh, but the Quran, in the sense believe, and it is a part of our faith, we have to believe that it's the literal word of God. The entire Quran is the literal word of God, and it has been saved as such. And the reason why it remains a historical, it remains free from human intervention, 
is because yeah, God himself has guaranteed that he will preserve it. That this is his revelation, that is his book, and he is going to preserve it. So in that sense, it is important for us to realize that the Quran has been preserved by God himself, even though human beings have taken various steps in order to preserve the Quran, taking care of the text, teaching our children. Uh, the most important and perhaps the biggest institutional effort that Muslims have made towards preserving the Quran is in memorizing the Quran. So even in Delaware, where the Muslim presence is so new, uh, we have a Quran Academy in Delaware that people learn to memorize the Quran. So memorizing the Quran is, is one of the most important ways in which Muslims honor the Quran, Muslims uh, embrace the Quran, and Muslims preserve the Quran. And then it's in the month of Ramadan that we recite the Quran as part of a special prayer called the Tarawi at the night. A lot of us read the Quran during the day. People, um, I, I know individuals who have the practice of, I know people who finish four or five Qurans a month, which means they're reading a Quran every week. Uh, so they re re rehearse it. Uh, some of them are, and of course, those who are half as a Quran or who have memorized the Quran. Uh, they also use the month of Ramadan to refresh their association with the Quran. So Quran has become a, a sort of a, a sacred text from the sense which, which they relate to it on a, on a basis of just reading the text is considered something sacred and biased. So just reading the text is part of, of our being a good Muslim. So the Quran is not just a sacred text that we read, it is also a source of guidance. The Quran in the first Ayah of Surah Bakr itself says that it is guidance for the believers. Zaratul Kitabullah refers to the Dalil Muttaqin, that this is a guidance for those who believe. So the purpose of the Quran is not just to memorize it and recite it, it is essential for us for our prayers, but the purpose of the Quran is also to find guidance, to find a purpose in life. So all these existential questions that human beings ask us who we are, where did we come from, what is the purpose, why did God create us, all these questions are derived. And our answers to these questions are essentially uh, derived from the Quran. Uh, the Quran is Muslims, and in, in the Quran itself, in the Quran has many names. Uh, uh, probably way more than the ones that I have been able to collect. Uh, but let me share some of them with you. The Quran describes itself as Al Kitab, the first ayah of Surah Bakr itself, Al Kitab. This is the book. The Quran also describes itself as Al Huda. So, Quran is the guidance, it's guidance to those who believe. Uh, sometimes, uh, mystical scholars make this very interesting distinction that one of the distinctions between the Prophet and the Quran is that the Prophet was sent as mercy to all of humanity, whereas the Quran was sent as mercy to believers. So, it is the believers alone who will benefit from the Quran. When the unbelievers approach the Quran, it, it emphasizes that character of yours that exists. So if you're a believer, it makes you a stronger believer. And if you're not a believer, it tends to have the opposite effect on you. So in that sense, it, it is a guidance, but it's a guidance to those who believe. It is Ar-Rahman, the mercy. The Quran is also called al uh, This is one of the most uh, comprehensive and more complex description of the Quran. For Quran means the criteria, the capacity or the ability to judge between what is right and what is wrong, to separate truth from falsehood. So the Quran acts as that criteria that segregates for Muslims what is right from what is wrong and also helps Muslims understand what is truth and what is falsehood. In a very famous uh, tradition of it, uh, uh, Somebody came to Aisha and asked her, can you describe to us the personality of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? And she said, haven't you seen the Quran? He liked the Quran. And I, after reading it, I always wondered, what is it about Prophet Lassam's personality? He's not Al-Kitab, but he's definitely al Huda. He guides. And I, I thought that perhaps this description or this name of the Quran al uh, applies probably the most appropriately to the Prophet also, because what he did is he taught humanity the capacity to judge between what is right and what is wrong. He didn't just teach us the rules of life, but he taught us to think ethically, to think morally, to be able to make moral judgments. And that capacity, that's what we call the rush, that's why somebody is mature. 
the difference between a mature person and an immature person is the inability of a mature person, of an individual to make appropriate decisions in what is immaturity. So how do you get this maturity? You can't buy it. It doesn't come into a degree. So maturity comes from experience, from wisdom, from hikmah, from knowledge, from also knowing and understanding your place in the world. And all of this comes from the Quran. It is a Quran. So for human beings to make existential decisions, which are better than other decisions, you have to have the capacity of Quran. And if you don't have it internally, when you approach the Quran, you develop that capacity. So you just don't memorize the Quran, you, you let the Quran flow through you. So what happens is when Quran, it's like adding something to water. So when, when the Quran is added to you, you develop these qualities which are there in the Quran. Rahma, you become more compassionate. You also develop the capacity of al Quran. The Quran is also called al zikr This is important when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we have the view of the zikr and we have guarded. He's referring to the Quran and zikr in, in other places, Allah SWT says that the, the most or the greatest thing for a person to do is zikr. So reading the Quran is a zikr, and even praying is a form of a zikr. So the Quran itself is zikr, and because we pray salah, and all we do in that salah essentially is read the Quran, and recite various chapters of the Quran. The salah is also a zikr. So, so that is something we must understand. The best zikr is uh, according to a tradition, la ilaha illallah. But the next best would be to recite anything from the Quran. And la ilaha illallah is also in the Quran. So the best forms of zikr, the most superior forms of zikr, all come from the Quran, are extracted from the Quran. The Quran is also called ash shifa This is also a description of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon us. So the personality of the Quran, the personality of the Prophet Muhammad, you can see how it works. Uh, ash shifa has two, two broad meanings. One is healing. So when you read the Quran, it heals. Uh, there are people who, who at least claim that when you are suffering to separate ailments, then there are other verses in the Quran that you can decide which will cure you from those ailments. That's a specialized knowledge of the Quran. I don't have it, so don't come and ask me later what should I do for my headache. Yeah, but uh, but shifa also means intercession. So the Prophet ﷺ would also intercede on our behalf on the day of judgment and so does the Quran. So those who recite the Quran and who read the Quran uh, frequently and regularly, uh, for them uh, the Quran will act as, a, as an intercession. will tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he needs to recite me a lot, forgive him. The Quran is also al-haq, the truth. Uh, and uh, the word haq is very interesting because it also means reality. So, Reality and truth. So al haq is both reality and truth in Arabic. The Quran is also called al Ma'isa, the admonishment. It, 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 it admonishes those who are on the wrong path. It admonishes those who are deviating from the truth. Uh, it admonishes those who forget God, those who are um, or those who are forgetful of God. Uh, the Quran is also called al Nur, it's the light. It's the light which means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has enlightened us. The whole purpose of sending the Quran to us was to take human beings out of, out of the remand, out of darkness, into light, into nur. So Quran is that instrument which is enlightening, it enlightens human beings. Uh, without the help of the Quran, you have to be a very profound philosopher or, or a very profound mystic to get this knowledge directly to yourself. So in the in the, in the absence of having direct access to the source of knowledge, uh, Quran is that instrument that is enlightening you. The Quran is also called Burhan, that which clarifies things to you. And one of the things that the Quran clarifies is the Quran itself. But the Quran is Hikmah, it is wisdom, and the Quran is also Wahi, it is revelation. These are just some of the names by which the Quran has described itself. And there are many other names. Al-Kitab, Al-Huda, Al-Rahma, Al-Qur'an, Al-Zikr, Al-Shifa, Al-Haq, Al-Ma'iza, Al-Nur, Al-Qur'an, Al-Hikman, Al-Wahi. Then proceeding to the next, the one way to think of the Qur'an for those of us who live in the West, uh, who live in uh, Western society, whether it be Europe or, or the Muslim world, is to think of the Qur'an as the final testament. 
uh, Christians and Jews consider the the Bible, the Torah, and the Bible as the first and the second testament. And uh, although the first religious societies which are open to interpret to think of the Quran as the final testament from God, there is going to be no other revelation from God. So the Quran is the final testament. Here are some interesting statistics I try to uh, collect for you. Uh, and some of it is basic knowledge that you all know. The Quran was revealed over a period of 23 years, from 610 to 632 AD. Uh, because the Gregorian calendar is slightly longer than the Islamic calendar, by 10 to 12 days, uh, 23 years in the Islamic calendar become 22 years in the Gregorian calendar. There are 114 surahs in the Quran that you all know, starting with Surah Fatiha. Uh, 86 of these surahs were revealed in Mecca in the first 13 years of the Prophet's life, and 28 of the surahs, the rest of them, were revealed in Medina. The surahs that were revealed in Mecca were in length, and they are more spiritual, more addressing philosophical issues. The surahs that were revealed in Medina tend to be longer. Like Maida, and they have tend to address sometimes issues which are very specific. So a lot of the legal nature of the Quran comes from surahs that were revealed in Medina, and most of the philosophical and mystical questions are answered by Quran that was revealed in Mecca. Uh, we don't have a completely accurate understanding of exactly which ayah was revealed in Mecca and which ayah was revealed in Latina. But more or less, by looking at the surahs and the style of the surahs, those who are experts can tell you that this is a Mecca surah or a Medina surah. But now we don't need to. There are scholars who have already made this uh, determination for us. They have already made the argument, and those things are all listed uh, as to which are the Mecca surah and Medina surah. One of the points that I do want to make here is that uh, when we preach the, the religion of Islam, we tend to be very specific and this, this is the truth and this is only the truth. And any other way of looking at it is not the way. Uh, that is not my way and uh, that is not how I share knowledge. Uh, I want you to understand that there are many ways, for example, uh, even on the issue of Surah Fatiha, there are three views. There are some who believe that it was revealed in Mecca, there are others who believe that it was revealed in Medina, and then there are those who believe that it was revealed twice once in Mecca and once in Medina. So there are three views among the Sahaba, and all the narrations and all these reports are equally strong. Uh, in the early days of scholarship, all the traditions were not available to everybody. For example, when you hear disputations between the Hanfi and the Shafis, etc., one of the reasons why they often came up with different solutions to problems was because they had access to certain sources and not others. But today we live in an age where we have all the traditions that can possibly be collected, unless we discover some books which are dated way back. Uh, a Hadith, a collection written by Sahaba that we don't know of which hasn't happened in the last 1400 years, you could say that we now have much better access to all the traditions that are available. So, so what happened, uh, this was available to scholars by 1800, 1100, or the third, fourth century of Islam, scholars had access to most of the sources. So then they started trying to make sense of this, and saying, oh, how can it be, some people are saying that Fatih was in Mecca, and was in Medina, how do we reconcile the facts when both the traditions seem to be equally valid. So a lot of ilm of Quran, or in fact a lot of knowledge of Islam, is often like that. And the reason why I'm pointing that out is because I want you to understand that that should give you a little pause not to be dogmatic in the positions that you take religiously, because it is not the sources will not allow dogmatism. The sources will not allow you to say, I am right and I alone am right. The sources will not permit you to do that. Uh, there are 6,237 ayahs in the Quran. The Quran is collected in many ways, some collected in 30 juz. The reason why the Quran is collected in 30 juz 
is quite optimistic. He could believe that we would like to read the Quran in one month. So if you are in the habit of reading the Quran in a month, then well, it's available to you in a juice. So you read a juice a day and you finish. People have also collected the Quran in manzils. Have you seen the Quran collected in manzil? Uh, what is interesting about the manzil is that it's in seven parts, which means that you will finish the Quran in a week. <laughs> so you will read one manzil a day, and within seven days, you will have read the whole Quran. People were more devoted in the past than we are. Many people listen to it. We try so much that we can listen to a manzil a day. But the Quran has been collected in many ways. The first ayah of the Quran, according to, to most sources, uh, is uh, 96, 1 to 5. So, so now the first five eyes of the surah are considered the first. But it was interesting to me while I was studying is that, that actually that is the dominant position, not necessarily the same. There is another authentic report which actually explains that the first five ayahs, or first four ayahs, uh, According to the Hadith of Aisha, which is the standard source that everybody takes uh, about the first revelation, so you go back to the Hadith of Aisha and she says that the Prophet liked solitude, so he would retreat to, to the cave of Hira. And then in his sleep, the revelation was in sleep. So in his sleep, he saw Jibreel who came down and then asked him to recite the Quran. He said, I cannot read, so he made him recite the first part. So the Hadith of Aisha said the first five ayats of the surah were revealed at that time. Uh, in the Sirah, uh, in the Isaac, it was the first four ayats of Ifrah were revealed. But there is a companion who says that it was the first four ayats of Surah Mudassir. Yeah, I heard Mudassir. Stand up and walk. These are the first ayats of the Quran that have been revealed. And the Hadith is also saying. Struggle to, to, to balance it uh, as to it. But the majority position is that they call this the first uh, revelation. Similarly, we have disagreements uh, or, uh, shall we say, different reports on uh, on which are the first and the last surahs actually. Uh, according to Ali Rabbilah, who the first surah was surah Sat. Entirely, in fact, he believed that that was the first ayah that was revealed. But as the way the scholars have reconciled this report is to say that perhaps when Imam Ali was saying that Surah Fatiha was the first revelation, what he meant was the first complete surah to be revealed is Surah Fatiha. And if you follow that tradition, then it also means that Surah Fatiha was revealed in Mecca and, and not in Medina. Uh, the second Interesting thing is that which is the last of these ayahs in the Quran? Uh, there, are, there is no agreement at all as to which is the last ayah of the Quran that is revealed. But most uh, reports basically say that the last few ayahs of Surah Al Baqarah, which is 281, 282, to, uh, or 278, may be the last ayahs which were revealed. So those ayahs are about the debtor, about taking loans, about Usually, a lot of people believe the ayah about the Buddha is perhaps the last ayah that is revealed. Some scholars also say that the third ayah from Surah Al Maida, that we have not completed the religion, is perhaps the last ayah. There is no consensus in it. Uh, I personally lean more towards believing that the 281 and 282 would have been the last ayahs of the Quran. 282, by the way, of Surah Al Baqarah is also the longest ayah in the Quran. It is longer than Ayat al Kursi. A lot of people think perhaps that Ayat al Kursi is the longest Ayat of the Quran. It's not. Uh, 282 Surah Al talks in details about, about lending and borrowing. Uh, about the last of the Surah of the Quran that we read, there is an important tradition by, narrated by Umar ibn Khattab, Rabbi Rawan, who says the Surah Tawbah was perhaps one of the last of the Surahs to be. Uh, review. It is interesting because Surah Tawbah is also the only surah which does not start with Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. 
all the surahs, 113 surahs, start with this by Rahman Ibrahim, Surah Tawbah, which is number nine in the way of Quran, it is because a lot of companions thought that it was an extension of Surah Al-Fahal, which is number eight. But because it is an extension of number eight, uh, there is no Bismillah, because there may be only 113 surahs. So Surah Maida is just an extension of the eighth surah. That's why there is no Bismillah. But what is also interesting is that there is no agreement whether this new lab is a revelation <coughs> in every surah or not. So the other 13 surahs, 113 surahs, even though they start with this new they are not numbered. Sometimes when you're reading books written by non-Muslim scholars, you will find that there's an error of one or two, three or four, sometimes in numbers. That is primarily because they are numbering the Shimla in all the other surahs. So the question is that when you recite Surah Fatiha, Bismillah is number one because part of the seven often repeated ayahs. But if you are reciting other surahs, you recite them with Bismillah, but it does not count as an ayah, it's not numbered in the Quran. So there are actually 112 extra verses in the Quran which are not numbered. And the, the way the scholars have tried to explain that to us in the past is to say that it is quite possible that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used Bismillah as a punctuation mark. So when the revelation came, and then when, when Jibreel would come and say Bismillah, then the Prophet sallam, would know that the previous revelation of the surah has ended, and now a new surah begins. That is one explanation. That the new surah has just begun, so Bismillah is used as a punctuation. <laughs> I don't know that because if you notice, Surah Al-Baqarah has been revealed over a period of two, two and a half years. So either there was no other revelation happening at the same time. What if they were overlapping? What if the Surah were overlapping? So, so, so that is an interesting issue for those of you who, want, who have wondered why Surah, uh, Surah Tawbah does not start. But Surah Tawbah is not considered as the last Surah by lots of people. Even Abba says Surah Al-Nasr is perhaps the last Surah Al-Nasr is perhaps the last Surah because that Surah, when that Surah came, lots of companions started crying because they understood They understood that the Surah was announcing the imminent death of Prophet That it became very clear to them that the Prophet is going to die now. That is what God is trying to say. That now the people are in, entering your faith in large numbers. Perhaps it's time for you to pause and take some time off and seek forgiveness with your God who's all forgiving. So, Surah Al Nasr is perhaps, uh, I, I, I lean more towards uh, accepting Surah Al Nasr uh, because it, it has, it, 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 it kind of signals to the people that, okay, not only is Prophet dying, but also revelation is coming to an end. And it's a very good uh, message on which uh, to end. Uh, some scholars believe that the reason why Surah Tawbah does not have this in life is because it was Surah which was revealed with Ayatul Sayyid. It has the, the words of the sword in it. It would be 27 or 29th ayah of um, Surah Tawbah. Yeah, 27 or 29th. Uh, Sheikh Yusuf al Tawdali has a very good book, two volume books called, so called Jihad on just on those verses of the Quran. But that is certain things that I wanted to share with you in terms of numbers and statistics of the Quran. But what I do want to ask you to is to, for those of you who are uh, looking at the internet, is to go to the slide number, uh, oh no, before I go to slide eight, but try to. Pull down the PowerPoint and prepare to go to slide number eight. Uh, during the period of Abu Bakr, there was a battle called the Battle of Yamama. And there was a false prophet who had declared himself a prophet. And in, in that war, according to some reports, 15, according to some reports, 70. 70 of the companions who had memorized the Quran died in the battle. So there was a loss of about 70 who passed. 
So Umar ibn Khattab feared that perhaps if all the people who have memorized the Quran died, and then Quran would be lost. During the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ, the Quran was never collected as a book. Many of his companions used to write down the Quran and keep. Many of them had their own collections and writings. Some wrote it on skin, uh, animal skin, some wrote it on papyrus. Uh, they also wrote it on sticks, literally, uh, and they used to keep it. But there was no authentic uh, or sorry, official text. And the primary reason was that no one knew when the revelation would end. The revelation was ongoing. So that's probably one of the reasons why people didn't feel the need to preserve the Quran. So, but when the, after the Battle of Yamama, when 60, 70 of these old fast died, uh, Umar ibn Khattab goes to Abu Bakr and says, I think it's time for us to collect the Quran. And Abu Bakr thought about it. He said, let me think about this. Because the Prophet Sallallahu didn't do it. Why would I do it? I mean, can you imagine if he tried to do something here, people say, bida, 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 <laughs> and scream at him. And maybe there were people in his town who have also screamed at him and said, ah, ah, da, bida, ah, da, bida. <laughs> but because the Prophet was not collected, why are you doing it? But he thought about it and he realized that it was a very wise thing to do is to collect the Quran. So he invited a companion, a very special companion called Zayed ibn Fadid, and gave him the task of compiling the Quran. So Zayed ibn Fadid was like a, like a secretary to the Prophet. So he used to write letters for him, but most importantly, he used to write down uh, the Quran when it was revealed. There were lots of people who were. Uh, called Wahi, they were called, who wrote down the Quran as the Prophet was dictated. But Zayed did it, was supposed to be the best of them, and he was acknowledged. Uh, and what is also interesting is that according to traditions, every year in the month of Ramadan, and that is why also we pay so much extra attention to the Quran during the month of Ramadan, Jibreel used to rehearse the Quran with Prophet Muhammad every Ramadan. However, and how much was revealed, he would go all over it with the Prophet. In the last Ramadan, he went over it with the Prophet two times. Can you imagine that? Uh, when I think of that moment, it is so so difficult. If, uh, if your teacher saying, "Well, I'm going to go over the lesson with you twice this time because you're going to die," so so I want to make sure that this is done. The message is obviously unsaid, but that message was there. So in the last month of Ramadan. He went over it twice. But as the Prophet was going over the Quran with Jibreel orally, he was going over it literally with Zayd ibn Fadid, who wrote it down as the Prophet. So the Prophet would, whenever he sat down with Jibreel and finished it, and he would call Zayd ibn and say, Okay, now write it down. So Zayd ibn Fadid wrote it down. So he was witness to both those versions, the final versions of the Quran. That's why Abu Bakr picked him and said, You're the guy who could. There were other scholars of the Quran. Ibn Masud, who was a very famous scholar of the Quran, Ibn Abbas, Ibn Abbas would be very young at that time, probably 13 or 14. But there were other people who were masters of the Quran, including Abu Bakr himself. So it is in the lifetime of Abu Bakr that you know, Zayd ibn Salih collected the entire Quran. And the way he did it was basically to go with his own notes, and then he went and other companions recited it, wrote it down, and verified it with many other companions, and then gave that copy to Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr nominated Omar as his successor. He gave him the copy. So after the death of Prophet also Omar had it. But after the death of Umar ibn Khattab, Umar's daughter Hatsa had the copy. And the reason why the, it went to his daughter was because Umar did not know who was his successor when he died. The successor of Abu Bakr knew who his successor was in, in, while he was alive, so he was able to, to give the copy to, to Umar, but Umar didn't know, so he gave it to his sister. Now, during the time of Osman, the third caliph, uh, something interesting began to happen. People began to recite the Quran in their dialects because the empire had enlarged and there were more and more people in the empire who were Arabs or non-Arabs also, even different kinds of Arabs. So they were beginning to recite. So one companion came to Islam and said, 
this is going to create complete chaos. This will destroy the Quran because people are deciding what, what they think they can decide. And so it is very important for us to authenticate and make sure that people do not recite what we want if this is for us. But you must understand something, and I will talk about it soon uh, in the next 10 15 minutes. Is the Quran was revealed in many dialects. They're called Ahruf. Half, different half. Ahruf is the proof of it. But anyway, after some time, Usman agreed to this decision and then went back to that and thought it that said, Look, you are the one who is going to collect it. And so he, but he gave a very interesting command. He said, You will correct, collect it in the dialect of the Quraysh because the Quran was revealed in the dialect of the Quraysh. And you will collect it and then if you disagree with any version, you will discard it and if you agree, you will keep it. So Zayn and Fabi collected it again, now in a group with a group of companions. And then after he finished the collection and came back to Usman, then Usman asked Hafsa to send a copy that she had. Now this copy is probably 14 years old. And then he verified Zayn and Fabi's second collection with his first collection and they were identical. And so he said, this is it. So he pulled in all the other versions of written texts that were being used around uh, the, the empire at that time, the Khilafa, and he destroyed them. And then they made, according to some five copies, according to some seven copies, according to some eight copies of this particular Masaf, it's called the Usmani script. And then he sent it to one of to, to the capitals of each of those provinces. Uh, and he kept one copy with himself, uh, which according to some traditions is the copy that he was reading when he was killed. It's exactly the same copy that he was reading to. So those of you who are logged in, if you look at, can you see the slide now? If you can look at the slide number eight, uh, you will see some of the copies. Now in the bottom, you see this thick one. Uh, the thick copy that you see from this, uh, you can see it's been tied with strings. That picture is a copy of one of those Usmani Qurans, uh, at least. Uh, it is in the Topkapi Palace in Turkey, in Istanbul. There are three, I think two are in Turkey. One is in Samarkand, Bukhara, uh, in somewhere in Central Asia. And the other one where you see these three gentlemen handling is also claimed to be one of those copies. Now this one, the one that was the gentleman. This is in the Husseini Mosque. Uh, this is across the street from Al Azhar University uh, near Khan al Khalili in, in Cairo, the city of Cairo. Uh, my son Rumi and I, and my family, we saw these two copies, the ones which are at the bottom. Now, if you look at the top one, top left one, I don't know whether I should ask you the question. I was tempted to say, can you recognize the handwriting? Well, the top left corner that is written in the Kufa script, it's called the Kufa script of, this is the Quran, which is supposedly now the oldest copy that we have. It is written by Imam Ali in the hands of them. So during the period when Hazrat Abu Bakr, uh, Hazrat Umar and Hazrat Osman were caliphs, one of the things that uh, Ali Rabi one who is that supposedly done is collected the Quran himself, not only collected it but wrote it with his hand. Uh, this copy is now available in Najaf, and according to carbon dating, it is dated to 640 AD, which would mean that eight years after the death uh, of Prophet. Uh, it's 97% 640 AD, it varies, but the latest it could be is 600. 50. So the timing for Ali is very good. So this could be a copy uh, that is written by Imam Ali. Now if you look at the Quran in the last two versions, so this one. This is, a, let me address the one before, the one in the middle on the top. This manuscript was found in a collection in a German university. And after they carbon dated that, they say that it is 675 AD, uh, which would mean about 675, would be 43 years after the death of Prophet Sulasa. Uh, they claim that that is the oldest copy of the Quran that is available to Germans. Uh, 
But this last one is very interesting. The last copy that you see on the right is from the Sana documents. In the 1970s, when the main masjid in Sana, Yemen, was being repaired, they found, when they broke a wall, they found lots of manuscripts. They put them in sacks and left it there for some time, potato sacks. Can you believe that? Uh, because once you were touching those those uh, paper or whatever the material was, it was melting away. But anyway, luckily, it attracted the attention of the main scholar of Quran in Yemen and he appealed and appealed to the German government. And over a year or two later, the German, German government gave a massive grant to study, document, and preserve that. So a German professor, you will find him on YouTube. If you just Google Sana Quran, you'll find him talking about it. He preserved it. He took all these photographs. First thing he did was to take photographs. And very smart. Took literally hundreds of thousands of photographs of all the documents. What is interesting is that now that it is available, people are studying it. They found that the, the, the manuscript that they found is identical to the Quran that we have now. Any Quran that you buy in the market that you go and get off of Amazon or wherever is identical to that. But when they did some x rays on it, they found that there was a previous copy written on it which was erased, and on top of it, this text of the Quran was written. And now they're trying to study what is below that for the last 10 15 years. And they found that there are small changes and small. The discrepancies in it, and to understand what those differences are, uh, for example, a lot of uh, there are lots of people who are not Muslims but who study Islam. Some study professionally into their curiosity. They usually do a pretty good job of research because they're not uh, handicapped by their beliefs, so their beliefs doesn't get into their way. They pursue what where the facts lead. Then there are those who study Islam in order to essentially pursue Islamophobic political goals. So today you will find that there are lots of people on the internet, especially if your children are browsing the internet in pursuit of Quran, you will find a lot of people who are claiming that, oh, uh, Muslims always say that uh, the Bible has been distorted or written by human beings, but now they can't make the same claim about the Quran because the Yemeni text proves that there are discrepancies between the world. But to understand, and for this, let me share with you a couple of traditions. One day, a companion called Ubay bin Kam was praying in the mosque. And another person came and he prayed. And he prayed the surah that he was praying differently. And then as Ubay was watching him, another man came in, and he also prayed the same surah and prayed it differently. Ubay was quite shocked that now he had there three versions of the same surah, he and two others. So he literally grabbed the necks of those two people, dragged them to the Prophet and said, you should listen to this man, how he was reciting the Quran. And the Prophet asked that man recite the Quran. And he recited the surah in exactly the way they had heard him recite in the mosque. And the Prophet listened to him and said, yes, that was how it was revealed. Then he has the next man to recite who recites the same surah differently. The tradition doesn't say which surah it was. And the second man recites the surah differently. And the Prophet says, Yes, it was revealed that way. And then Ubay says, But Ya Rasulullah, I recite it differently. And the Prophet said, How do you recite it, Ubay? And Ubay recites the surah. And the Prophet listens to him, and then at the end of it says, Yes, it was revealed that way. So now Ubay says, he's narrating the story, he said, I was shocked. And I was a doubt emerging. He started feeling that this can't be divine text if it, there can be so much difference. And I think the Prophet also saw it on his face and actually hit him on his chest very hard. There are very, I don't, I have never read any other tradition that the Prophet struck any other person or hit his companion. But he hit Ubay on his chest and said, Ubay, I want you to know this, that when the Quran was revealed, it was revealed in seven ahruf. First it was revealed in one, but I pleaded to my Lord that my Ummah is composed of old people, composed of women, old women, sick people who are from different parts of the country. They all cannot recite it like this. 
So then Adam came and so then Gabriel came back and said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permits three Arabs. Then Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi pleads again. And then he says, okay, then I will let them breathe in seven different Arabs. And he said, and then a very interesting point. Prophet Sallallahu said, God gave me three concessions. I have used up two. One was when he went up and got 50 prayers, remember? And then he reduced it to five. The second was this, so the Quran can be recited in different dialects. And the third one is uh, on the Day of Judgment, he will intercede on our behalf and ask God for our forgiveness. Umar ibn Khattab also narrates a very interesting story. He says he was in the mosque when a man came in and recited Surah Al-Qur'an very differently. And Umar did the same thing, grabbed him by his neck and dragged him to the Prophet and said, you have to listen how this man is reciting. And the man was telling the Umar, this is exactly how Rasulullah taught me. Umar said, no, that's not how he taught me. He dragged him and then they listened to him and the Prophet said, yes, this is how revealed. And confirmed to both Umar and to that companion that both their reading, even though they are different, so the Quran, they are both correct. Now, these are the two ahadith that are available to us about ahadith or seven ahadith, some say ten, some say seven different ways. Now, we fully don't understand what they mean. Okay, is it different dialect? Is it a different way of pronouncing it? Is it written differently? So if you go back and look at it, scholars have made a lot of interesting arguments with evidence from the Quran. And they argue that it has been written in seven different styles. It is recited also in many different styles. So for example, uh, in one of my slides, uh, I think it is slide number 10, you can see they, by the 11th century, Muslims had accepted 10 different styles of recitation of the Quran from different cities. And they named the person, like in Surah Al in Basra, Abu Amr and his style of narration was accepted as authentic. In Kufa, Al Qisai and the way he was narrating. In Madida, Abu Jafar and his narrations. But right now in the world today, 95% of all the Qurans are in the same way. It's called, I think, Wash and there's another person. Yeah, there are only two versions now that are available in terms of recitation, etc. But I want you, like, for example, Navid, can you just recite the first three ayahs of Surah Fatiha? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, Maliki Yomir. See, when we, uh, Sheikh Hisham is not here, but when you listen to Malik. Sheikh Hisham. Malik. Yeah, when you listen to him recite Surah Fatiha to the Tawabi, he said, Maliki Yomiddin. He said, Malik, not Malik. So there are those who say Maliki Yomiddin and those who say Malik. Now, it's not just a pronunciation difference. The word itself means two different things. Malik means owner. So you translate that as the owner of the day of judgment. So when you say Maliki Yomiddin, you are saying Allah is the owner of the day of judgment. When you say Malik, you're saying he's king of the day of judgment. Both are written differently and they are recited differently, but they mean the same thing. Because even if you're the king of the day of judgment, you obviously own it and so on and so forth. So this is one of the standard examples that people give about what is the different recitation and different way of writing. Uh, now we have a very standardized Quran which can go back for many centuries. You will find it's the same thing. Uh, but if you find more excavations, like if you start finding old Qurans which are uh, 1350 years old or more, then you will find that these written variations may come. But you must also understand that for, for Muslims, the Quran was not a written revelation, it was an oral document. So the authenticity comes from oral recitation and not from. So the mistakes could have been in writing because the individuals, many of the people who who memorize but not very literate. So, so that is an important point to remember about the Quran that it has been revealed in many dialects. So especially when we live in the West, when people recite the Quran differently, new converts uh, describe it differently. I think people should uh, hesitate to go and collect them right away 
and should be more tolerant of different pronunciations because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recognizes that people come from different languages and so they will recite it differently uh, and they will maybe even read it differently. But there are some key elements of the Quran that I would like to share with you. Um, it, is it is incumbent upon all Muslims to know the Quran. You need to memorize part of it or you will not be able to pray if you don't memorize part of it. But if you don't fully read the Quran, you will never know much of your religion and much about God. Because you must understand that as we believe it to be the literal word of God, the word Quran is recitation in Arabic, but we describe Quran as everything that God <laughs> says. Quran is not a book that was written. Quran is the speech of Allah. So for us, we are in possession of an attribute of God, which is the Kalam Allah. So that proof of God for us, with us. So it will it, be quite tragic that if you keep the proof of God in some shelf somewhere in your house and not access it as often as possible. And, and when you do it, only do it in a ritualistic sense. I think it's important that all of us should get to know the Quran and develop a relationship with the Quran. Uh, one of the ways in which people have interpreted Ahruf is to say that when God says, or when Prophet says seven, he just meant many. And so, and one meaning of different Ahruf could be different meaning, which means the Quran itself could have many, many different meanings. And we can only develop it as we grow in life. We, we will understand the Quran differently. I can tell you that in my own life, I have. I had a relationship with certain verses of the Quran that I had written about 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And when I go and look at it, what I wrote about certain ayahs, and I think about them now, my understanding is different. The Prophet said, if you're the same person, to the implying that you have to get better and better. So, so there's certain things we need to understand. One thing about the Quran is that the Quran is the Quran only in Arabic. It is not Quran if you're reading the English translation or the Urdu translation. It is only Tarjuna of Quran. It is not the Quran. Uh, uh, for example, a few years ago, the United Nations was printing T-shirts with one ayah from every religious text, uh, which, which referred to peace. So they selected one ayah from the Quran and they wanted to peace. And they found that the ulama in India were objecting to and somehow they got hold of me and they called me and said, what do we do? I said, why are the women objecting? Because if you pin the t-shirt without Islam, then it would mean that Islam does not have anything to say about peace. I mean, why are they objecting to it? So the women in India were saying, well, they're going to give it to people who are going to wear it and then they're going to go to the bathrooms with it, <laughs> wearing the t-shirt with Quran written on it. And I thought of for a moment that then they suddenly occurred to me the Quran is Quran only in, in, in Arabic. I said, just try the translation in English. That way many people in the world can read it since we are distributing this t-shirt globally. So people in India anywhere would be able to see this is what the Quran says. And no Mullah can object because this is not the Quran. And if they ask you, tell you why you would first tell the Quran is Quran only in Arabic, that is the truth. So you must understand that, yes, for all of us who are who may be new converts, etc. It will be a struggle to learn a new language and learn, but it is important to understand that the Quran is Quran because only then is it the direct, exact word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise, it is not a word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are three or four interesting concepts about the Quran that I want to talk about to you. One is that in verse uh, 7 of the uh, third surah, okay. So in Maryam, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is very interesting. He says, it is he who has sent down to you a Muhammad, the book. In it are verses that are precise. Mm -hmm. They are foundations of the book. And in it are verses that are allegorical. So the Muhammad, who al-Razi andal alayka al-Kitab, mean who ayat Muhammad. Muhammad, which are clear. Muhammad should also mean which are uh, Commanding, which give you command, uh, and they are also the foundation. Hum ummul kitab. The word ummul kitab means many things, the core or foundation of the book. And then there are verses which are allegorical. 
Now, this is an important ayah. Many scholars say that you cannot fully understand the Quran unless you know which ayahs are muhkam and which are mutashabiyah, which are allegorical and which are not. Now, that's a very difficult challenge. Fadl Rahman of Pakistan, a very important scholar, not the current politician, sir, was a professor. The argument that you cannot fully understand the Quran unless you know whether this verse is clear or is it an allegorical word. How do you know which is Mahkam and which is Mutashabiyah? And unfortunately for us, the Prophet did not leave us with a list of the ayahs. So it's what at the minimum it does is, especially when we come across verses in the Quran which may be completely out of sync with our time or space, is to be a little guard and a little hesitant to claim that we understand this verse exactly the way it is, right? and, and to make it a rule or to kill people based on certain interpretations of the text, because we don't know whether it's Mutashat or, or Mahakam. Uh, I give you one or two examples. For example, scholars give this ayah. Uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Laysa ka mislihi shayun. There is nothing like him. Exact ayah which has no other meaning. So if you're an, uh, an expert in Arabic grammar and language and you read this word, Laysa ka mislihi shayun, this sentence, then you will realize that this is a medical ayah. There is no way you can interpret it any different way. There is nothing allegorical about it. However, if you were to read the ayat from Surah Rahman, Bismillah ar-Rahman, But how would you interpret this? Uh, everything on earth is perishable, or everything on earth will perish. Some people have translated it and interpreted it to say that everything that exists will perish except the face of Allah, uh, which is both majestic and noble. Now, what does that mean? So what is going to happen to heaven and earth? Hell, will they also cease to exist? Aren't we supposed to be living in heaven or hell forever and ever? So what does the Quran mean that nothing will exist except the face of Allah? And so it raises all kinds of weird questions like this. Why just the face of Allah? What are the other parts of Allah? Will they survive? Will they not survive? Now, this is an example of a mutashabiha. This is an ayah which is not clear. This is not something on the basis of which you make laws. So this is something that we need to know when you start getting into speculative philosophy or you get into discussions of Kalam, that this is an important stuff. So those of us who are, or those of you who are thinking of understanding the Quran, you must keep in mind that every understanding of every verse is a work in progress you say okay at the moment this is how i understand this when i get more facts i will have a better understanding of the Quran. that has to be the alam. that that feeling should be there that that uh, uh, instead of arrogance uh, the word i'm looking for is humility that humility should be there in our approach and our understanding of the Quran that, my God, things could change, things could change uh, as we learn more. Uh, there are those who believe that as you develop a relationship with the Quran, then you can learn more or you can learn less. I'm sorry, those who move away from the straight path, they begin to even forget the Quran. So their understanding of the Quran can diminish and God curses them. But those who have a regular relationship with the Quran, their understanding becomes deeper and deeper. It's as if the Quran is dropping a veil after a veil after a veil after a veil as you go and find more and more of its deeper and deeper meanings. So those people who, the well, scholars and um, Mufassir in the Quran who claim that there are hidden meanings in the text, uh, they they point to this, this ayah of Mutashabiha in the Quran. Uh, besides allegory, there is another important issue in the Quran, that is of the theory of abrogation of the Quran. But before that, let me talk to you yeah, about the ayahs itself. There are two ayahs, one is Surah Al-Baqarah and one Surah 16, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we do not abrogate a verse or cause it to be forgotten, except that we bring forth one better than it or similar to it. 
Do you not know that Allah is over all things competent? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah itself, مَا نَنْسَخْ مِنْ آيَاتٍ أَوْ مُنْسِحَا نَاتٍ بِخَيْلْ مِنْهَا Unless we reveal something which is exact, better than it, أَوْ مِسْلِحَا Or exactly like it. So for example, uh, we have in the past used uh, the, the verse, for example, on alcohol. There are three different verses on alcohol in the Quran. Uh, one is in Surah Al-Baqarah, which says that in them there is great sin, both in gambling and wine. In them there is great sin, there is some benefit for people. Now when this ayah was revealed, some people choose not to drink, some people chose to drink. So after that, there was another verse in the religion. Oh, you have believed, do not approach prayer while you are intoxicated until you know what you are saying. One of the companions actually read the salah while he was drunk and he kept making mistakes while reciting the Quran. And after that, this verse came which said that do not approach salah. So now what happened was that in the previous case, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just basically said oh, there are bad things in alcohol and gambling. Uh, there is some good, so people continue to use it. And then he said, do not. So people continue to drink, but make sure that they did not drink before they prayed. And then you have the final in Surah al Maya that the ayah said, oh, you who have believed in deep intoxicants and gambling, uh, uh, that is playing with stones, etc., and arrows uh, are, are from Satan, so avoid them so that you may be successful. And this ayah is considered completely uh, banning both gambling and alcohol consumption. So if you notice that it went from saying it's, it's a bad thing, or okay, don't do it while you're praying, to don't do it. So this is given as a standard example of how the Quran abrogates the law or changes the law. Uh, but what is interesting is that just because, of, uh, like if you take the literal text of the ayah, which says do not approach prayer while you're drunk. When you say that ayah is abrogated, it doesn't mean that you can approach the Quran or prayer while you are drunk. It just means you just can never drink any time. Uh, but let me give you another example, which is the most straightforward example of abrogation in the Quran. The reason why I'm spending a little bit of time on this is because some scholars have argued that abrogation is not there in the Quran. There are some modernists like the, the previous Muhammad Ghazali, uh, he was the uh, Sheikh al Azhar in the 1950s, 1960s. He believes that there is no such thing as abrogation in the Quran. But if you look at this ayah, this is the 65th and the 66th. Uh, abrogation is always in two ayahs. They are always in pairs. That which is nas and that which is nusra. That which is abrogating and that which is abrogated. So there always have to be two ayahs. When you say this is abrogated, you have to show which words abrogates it. So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the 65th ayah of Surah al anfal O Prophet, urge believers to battle. If there are among you 20, who are steadfast, they will overcome 200. And if there are among you 100 who are steadfast, they will overcome a thousand. Those who disbelieve because they are people who do not understand. So when this ayah came, the Sahara was there, I think, what are you telling us? You were telling us that we should go into battle with the odds of 1 is to 100, right? Then you have 20, you can handle 2,200. So this is a 1 is to 20, uh, 10, sorry. So if I am attacked by nine disbelievers and I run away, I become a disbeliever. I mean, I'm supposed to fight 10. You know, like kind of, <laughs> the verse is very clear. It says, if you are 20, you should fight 200. If you are 100, you should fight 1,000. Immediately, another verse is revealed, which in the Quran is right afterwards, in which Allah says, Now Allah has lightened your hardship for you, and He knows that among you is weakness. So some of you are weak. So if from you 100 who are steadfast, they will overcome 200. So the ratio is immediately reduced from 1 is to 10 to 1 is to 200. So basically, if you're attacked by two non Muslims, you have to stand there and fight. If there are three, then you can run. <laughs> you have to fight with two. But prior to that, you have to fight until there were 11 before you decide to run. So, so this is a very clear example of abrogation in the Quran, the previous words. 
is abrogated by the words that is revealed. There is a sequence in time. There are other ways in which people use the concept of abrogation. They say the Quran has abrogated all that was revealed prior to so Jibreel, uh, I mean Injil and the Torah and other religious texts which are revealed before the Sharia of those texts has been abrogated and only the Sharia of the Quran is valid anymore. So abrogation is used in that sense. The Muslim scholars have described ab abrogation in five ways. One is where the entire Quran abrogates all the previous civil texts. So this is the final and the only testament. It's not just the final testament, but the only testament. Then the Quran abrogates Quran. I've given you some examples of how Quranic verses abrogate other words. Quran abrogates Hadith. So if there are uh, uh, traditions in the Hadith which contradict the Quran, then the Quran prevails every time. So Quran abrogates what is in the Hadith. And then there are scholars who talk about Hadith abrogating Hadith, which means that uh, you have the Prophet also may have permitted something up to a point and then he reverses his position later and changes it. So that is how one hadith abrogates the previous one. There are some scholars who actually argue that hadith can also abrogate the Quran. Now that is a very tricky and very controversial issue to go in, but the example that is often used is, is the hadith in Bukhari for stoning. There is no verse in the Quran which says we should stone the adult to punish only lashing. But there's a hadith in, in Bukhari in which, which Umar ibn Khattab, after coming back from Umrah, says, I didn't insist at that time to include it in the Quran because it would have created trouble. And, but we all remember the verse of stoning to death. So apparently it was in the Quran. So you have this very strange case of ayatul, uh, this, this stoning, uh, called ayatul rajam, where the ayah is not in the Quran, but the hukum of the ayah is in the Quran. Do you understand? Like, for example, this verse that I recited, where if you face odds of 1 is to 10, you should stand and fight. Now, that ayah is in the Quran, but the hukum has been abrogated. So the law that you derive from that words doesn't exist anymore. But if this is a reverse case. Because the ayah doesn't exist in the Quran, but the law apparently exists. This is a claim that scholars are making. Many Muslim scholars have subscribed to this idea. But this is a very the only case that I know of where people have used the tradition to essentially go and say that the hadith says this, and so we should actually do this abrogation. So while the ayah is not in the Quran, the hukum is in the Quran. But even though abrogation is actually of the hukum and not of the text. So that is an interesting thing for us to know. For those people who try to write the field of the Quran, etc., they need to understand uh, that uh, which verses of the Quran are abrogated and which are not. For example, when I was giving the khutbah uh, before the month of Ramadan, I only recited ayahs 183 and 185 of Surah Al-Baqarah, which deal with uh, the fasting. Uh, because 184 is abrogated by 185. So 185 abrogates 184, so the rulings are in 183 and then 185. So when I knew that, so I, I did not talk much about the IR 184 in Surah Al-Bakhara. So that is very important. So one of the things that people who try to, to keep the Quran, we need to understand is at least our understanding. We have lots of it. There are scholars who have listed 145 verses which have been abrogated. Uh, one of the biggest scholars of, uh, of the Quran or Ilm al Quran is uh, Suyuti, uh, who's an Egyptian scholar, very famous. The Jalaluddin Sufi, the Jalalain, the Tafsir that you see, he and his student wrote it, both the Jalal. He reduced it to 21, and he said there are only 21 sets of ayahs in the Quran. Then came Shah Wali Allah in India, who looked at those 21 and pro provided explanations for that, and then he reduced it to say there are only five sets of abrogations in the Quran. It weighs. People who privilege Surah Tawbah, when the Ayat is saved in Surah Tawbah, they abrogate every verse in the Quran which is it, you know, which, which is about tolerance, uh, etc. So, so a lot of extremist interpretations have also used abrogation to essentially 
silence the tolerance that is so loud in the Quran. Another important aspect of the Quran is what we call it Asbab al Nuzul, that is slide 15. Asbab al Nuzul are causes of the revelation of the Quran. We can talk about it as causes or context when the Quran was revealed. So I think I'll just try to shoot for 825. You know? yeah. So now, to, to give you an example of uh, Asbab al Nuzul, uh, for example, if you look at this ayah of La Ikraha Fiddin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Bakhara, La Ikraha Fiddin, Hat Bayyina Rush, you know that. There shall be no compulsion in acceptance of religion. So, now when you read the ayah, there is no compulsion in religion, then you keep wondering, mm -hmm. so if there is no compulsion in religion, then why do Muslims enforce the Islamic law? Why do we punish people for doing various things? Why do we lock up people for not fasting in the month of Ramadan, eat publicly? Why do we lash people for drinking alcohol? So why are there hudud punishments and so on and so forth if there is no compulsion in religion? So in order to understand that, we have to understand how Muslim scholars understood this. And one of the things that they use is as well, the context, the historical context. Unfortunately, we do not have the circumstances of revelation of all the eyes. The first book which was written about this Azbab is by Al-Fai Al Al Wahidi, which has only 564 ayahs of the Quran for whose context he is written it down. If you Google Azbab al Nuzul by Wahidi, W R A H I D I, the whole book is in English translation and Arabic and Urdu available in PDF format on the web. You can see that there are only about uh, 500 and odd verses whose context recognizes. Like I wanted to give an example. So when I was looking for many other that I wanted to use today, I didn't find any historical context, at least in his book. The other source where you would find a lot of Azbab is in the earliest of the Tafsir. So if you look at the Tafsir of Tabari, you would find a lot of uh, examples of when this verse was revealed, what it is. It's very interesting when you read the classical Tafsir of the Quran, every ayah, the companions of the Prophet are actually trying to figure out which person is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trying to talk about. We, we don't think of it like that anymore. We take the ayahs as general, but they often thought in terms of specific individuals. Which individual is Allah subhanahu wa talking about? Which tribe is he talking about? Which event is he trying to talk about? Because it's being revealed just at that time. right? So the context sometimes is available in the early classical tafasis and the Sira literature in the stories. But you must understand that both the Sira literature and the Azbab and Nuzul literature are not as authentic say, as the Quran or the Hadith. So if you look at this, if you look at slide 16, next slide, this is the Azbab. And this is what Wahidi writes about this ayah. Now there are, he gives at least four, three or four different contexts. There was one Sahabi whose sons were Christians. They became Christians and they went away and lived among Christians. Then they came back to shop or for some trading to Medina and then he basically captured them. and said, I will not let you go until you convert to Islam. And they said, no, we are not going to convert to Islam, his sons. So his sons, and they went to, to, to Rasulullah to complain. And saying he's not letting us go. And he said, I will not let them go unless they become Muslims. And then this ayah of Allah, there is no compulsion in religion. There's another circumstances. For example, one of the Jewish tribes, which was expelled, they had to leave the children behind. And they said, well, if you leave our children behind, if you bring them up, you will bring them up as Muslims. Why are you forcing our children to become Muslims? Do we want them to be follow the tradition of Jewish? And then the Prophet course is like Rah the, the Jibril has just revealed to me that there is no compulsion, which means nobody will be forced. So there are, it's very important sometimes for us to understand. Um, there is a verse in Surah Al-Nisa, which, uh, which is of course a very controversial one, in which um, in certain interpretations the husband is given permission to, to beat his wife. Now, if you go and read the Azbab of this ayah, it's very interesting. 
there are two or three cases where fathers have come and complained to the Prophet saying that my daughter, I married it to this man and now he hit my daughter, what should we do? And in every case, the Prophet responded by retaliation. He said, smack him back. In fact, he told this one particular person that you and your daughter, you both can beat him up. If he beats your daughter next time, you both beat him up. And then he calls them back and says, wait a minute. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Jibreel just came with this revelation, you can't hit him back because he is in charge, man is in charge in the family. And in that tradition, the Prophet says, what can I do? I wish one thing, but Allah wished something else. So it's a very interesting context when so you go back and read the historical context. This is called Azbab al nuzul There's only one more thing that I want to talk about today is that because of the growth of Islam, Muslims in different civilizations and different traditions, uh, Tarjama has become very important. And so it's very important for us to be able to understand the Quran in our language. So this month of Ramadan, those of you who are not fluent in Fusa, uh, the these days the Arabic that is spoken in most Arab world it does not correspond to the Arabic of the Quran. So those of you who cannot read the Quran and understand it, uh, should read the Quran in the Tarjama that is available in your language. So you should read it. Uh, there are two ways in which the Quran has been explained by scholars. Uh, one is called Tafsir. Tafsir is an explanation of the verses of the Quran. It relies on Asbab of Nuzul, on knowledge such as whether this verse is abrogated or not, when was it revealed in Mecca or in Medina, and then tries linguistically and based on these traditions to explain. The best of series is when you use the Quran to explain the Quran. The second best of series is when you use the Hadith literature to explain the Quran. And then the third is when you use opinions of the companions to explain the Quran. And then after that, you can do your ishtihad uh, to understand and explain the Quran. The final way in understanding the Quran is called Taweel. Uh, this is a very controversial way. What Taweel really does is that it tries to search for the hidden meanings in the Quran. It is not, tafsir is not a search of hidden meanings. Tafsir is a search of legal meanings which can be defended upon rational understanding of the text. Tawil is more of a mystical understanding of the text. Uh, some people may actually say that we should not do Tawil, but there is a, clearly a verse uh, where, for example, this is in the 18th Surah 78th verse uh, during the encounter between Khidr and Musa al Islam. Khidr actually says, uses the word that when I explain things to you that with Taweel or using Taweel you understood them but before that you not. So all the, the entire episode of Khidr, Musa could not understand why Khidr is doing what he is doing, why is he killing this child, why is he building this wall, why is he making holes in the boat? Because Khidr had access to knowledge which Moses did not. So Khidr is trying to explain to Moses that there is another way of understanding things based on who you are, your knowledge, and that is called Taweel, to understand Taweel of the Quran. Not everybody doesn't have the fact that everybody is not Qidr, <laughs> so everybody should not do Taweel, but there are examples that scholars in the past have done Taweel and have done incredible jobs, so, so you should also pay attention to it. <coughs> Uh, when in the third session, when I talk about different Islamic discourses, I will also talk about different ways in which Muslims have interpreted the Quran. Those who relied on hadith, those who relied on language, like Zamakshari, the very famous Tafsir, which bases a lot of emphasis on the knowledge of Arabic grammar. And there are people like Tustari and other Sufi scholars who use Taweel to understand and explain the Quran. <coughs> Some scholars argue that there are four ways of understanding the Quran. One is the simplest way of ordinary people, which is understanding linguistically. You read the Tarjama of the Quran and you understand. Then the second way of understanding it is based on the knowledge of the traditions, of the ahadis, etc. Where you understand that this ayat is an ahkam ayat, this ayat is not an ahkam ayat, this ayat is abrogated. You have a knowledge of, of the Quran, the history of the Quran, and are able to understand it. This is the, the ulul al-bab people who are uh, not Ulul al people, Ulul al people who are uh, among the elite who can understand the Quran. The third understanding is based on Taweel, 
if people understand the hidden meanings of it, the spiritual meanings of the Quran. These are people who are the friends of, of Allah, Wali Allah. So you have the Sufi saints and Sufi scholars who will provide meanings to you uh, of the Quran which you otherwise would not have thought. Um, and then the highest level is the understanding of the Prophet of the Quran because of the direct contact with either angel or angel Gabriel who's revealing it to them or to the Quran. So I want to end this discussion of the Quran. Thank you for all of you who came and thank you for all the other people who have logged in to listen to it. Uh, is that, you know, the Quran has been revealed in many, many steps. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a messenger to his messenger. I think of Jibreel as messenger to the messenger of Allah with the Quran. He brought the Quran to the Prophet Sallallahu And then the Prophet Sallallahu brought the message to us. But in the month of Ramadan, I think that at the minimum, we should bring the message of the Quran to ourselves. We should become messengers of God to ourselves to learn more about the Quran. To read it, it is more important than recitation, than just listening to it in a foreign language that you do not understand. If you read and understand one surah of the Quran, it is much, much better than, than reciting it hundred times. Because the once you understand the word of God, now you're communicating with God. Just listening is good, but but understanding and listening means you're communicating with God. So inshallah, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gives us all the opportunity. To, to understand the Quran, to approach the Quran in a much more meaningful way, and also to develop an understanding of this wonderful connection that we have uh, to our God. Uh, that we are already in the mode, the month of Ramadan, we already are attuned towards the Quran, towards trying to understand the Quran. And so we should take advantage of it and try to read as much as possible in the language that we understand. Jazakallah. Yeah, I think four minutes to